so we are seeing the share of gold in india's forex reserves has jumped so here we when we are analyzing the changes or the trends in the forex reserves so one part is gold then second we can also talk about the foreign currency assets how their value is changing depending upon the exchange rate so particularly we are seeing the the share of gold is increasing like uh, this is not just the trend in case of india it is being visible in terms of the central bank reserves in case of china and turkey so gold it acts like a hedge against the geopolitical tension it it helps in risk aversion or risk mitigation so and also to reduce the dependency on the US dollar as well. So these are the three reasons that we can say. And we are also seeing the spike in the gold prices. It has risen 17% since January 2024. So the, that can be because of the increase in the demand also and also because of global uncertainty. So gold is relatively considered to be much more safer asset or safer investment. Plus high interest rates in advanced economy. So people are more driven towards investment in gold be it through the sovereign gold bond also in case of India. So forex reserves, if we look at the numbers, so it is at $667 billion right now. And the share of gold, you can see it has increased from $47.5 billion to $57.5 uh, billion. Or I think this should be in terms of percentage. It, not clearly mentioned, but it has increased. It should be billion dollars only if it is not percentage. And in the graph also, we are seeing the growth and share of the gold in the Forex Reserve. So it has spiked after March. 2024 so changes is approximately nine percent change or increase has been seen the next topic And rising income is driving a revival in the household savings. So as we were just talking about that investment rate should also increase. So that would be only driven if the savings are increasing because ultimately savings are channelized into investments. And that can be again into different forms. It can be into land and gold. As we say that these are unproductive assets because they are not directly helping in further channelizing of or investment of that fund. And it can be through the capital market also. It can be through the financial market also or the money market also. So rising income. So this indicates that if real income is increasing then we can say household savings would also increase so for example the physical savings has risen in the post pandemic years to over 12 percent of the gdp and it could rise further to 16 percent so these are the numbers and so if income is increasing, that can be again because of the rising productivity and the thrift of the workforce. So when we say that thrifty nature, so thrifty nature is the, the propensity to save should increase. So uh, rise in the efficiency of capital will lead to fall in the capital output ratio. So this is also one of the, the relations. So capital output ratio is one which we are tracking to assess the changes in the labor productivity particularly capital to output ratio how much units of capital are being used to produce one unit of output so the lesser the capital more would be the efficiency and lesser if lesser is the capital lesser would be the cost of production also so this would increase the profits and if profits are increasing then definitely we can say that it reflects a positive and a uh, great momentum and that that can translate or transform into even higher incomes also and that can be sustained as well so india is at the cusp of a distinct demographic advantage and an investment of rupees 2 to 3 trillion per annum over next 6 years is needed to finance our projects the focus areas of skilling upskilling and reskilling and importance of corporate bond market is also important for deepening the financial sector. So again, as we we're just mentioning about capital sector, so the capital market would be driving more investments here also. So this is also one part of reforms.
next topic then uh, we are seeing again prime minister's visit to brunei so amid south china sea tensions we are focusing upon the defense sector as well so in case of defense when we are seeing again china's unilateral actions particularly in south china sea when we talk about the concerns related to 9 dash line and violations of the exclusive economic zone rights of the different of the neighboring countries so these are certain concerns and apart from this building of artificial islands and then militarization of those islands by china is a major concern so that is why uh, focus upon defense sector, role of quad is important, role of AUKUS becomes important, ASEAN is important to stabilize. Then West Bengal enacts stricter anti-rape law. So this is called the Aparajita Bill. And the bill has been passed punishment for the rape convicts if their actions result in victim's death or leave her in a vegetative state in life sentence without parole for other perpetrators. So Aparajita Woman and Child Bill, 2024. We have covered this. Okay. So, greener future nations must work as one on renewable energy. And this would be also enhancing the mitigation of the carbon emissions as well. So, joining hands on the energy triad. So, we need efforts from governments, businesses, and international organizations to build global solar ecosystem. For example, when we are seeing again the, the target levels like Panchamri target, so in that one of them is the achieving the level of 500 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2030. So right now we have that the short term target is achieving the 20% share of renewable energy by uh, I think 2025 or 26. But in terms of gigawatts, it is 500 gigawatts. So here we have the National Electricity Plan 2023, the Central Electricity Authority. So this projects India's energy storage capacity requirement to grow exponentially to 82 gigawatts hours by 2026. So this showcases the even the strategic importance, even the importance from the perspective of the growth of the economy because power supply and energy security will be playing a critical role amid the impacts and the risks emanating from climate change as well. Then complementing energy generation with the storage. So here we have another scheme also, which is the battery energy storage scheme, where we are focusing more on the battery manufacturing. We have the PLI scheme particularly to boost the manufacturing. We have, again, financial incentives on incremental output for the batteries being manufactured, like lithium-ion batteries or even sodium-ion batteries are. They are also, they're still efficient. Then particularly like uh, in terms of power again we are focusing we we have great potential even in the hydroelectricity power generation so there for example we have uh, we are importing from bhutan and nepal so that is also even uh, we can say critical step by mm -hmm. india how we are leveraging the natural resources efficiently and not exploiting them policy interventions would be playing important role for example we have uh, Germany's uh, energy vendor policy. It promotes integration of renewable energy and energy efficiency so, so that we can significantly reduce the greenhouse gases emissions. So financial incentives can be in the form of tax credits, subsidies and grants. And in case of India, like uh, we, we are also promoting the, the, the functioning or we are like into the development of the carbon market as well then there are renewable purchase obligations carbon trading carbon certificates green credits so this is also one of the methods to which we can promote so financial front mate is estimated annual clean energy investments will be increasing to 4.5 trillion dollars by 2030 and major would be in renewable energy then international collaborations India is again the pioneer and the initiators when you talk about international solar alliance and when we're talking about one world, one grid, one sun. So this is one thing. And then the India is again leading voice of global south. So even in terms of like 
sustainable and alternative fuel that is biofuel generation as we have seen that we are collaborating with Brazil particularly in sugarcane sector. Why Gift City needs relaxed listing norms? So the creation of Gift City and the again the we are, we are seeing the initial growth and the spike and the interest by even foreign players to set up their units and their presence in the Gift City showcases the the critical importance of the financial technology network which is there the demand of the financial services and its usage in India. So what is an IFSC and how does it work? So International Financial Services Centers, Gift City bhi bolte hum isko. And this was brought about under the Special Economic Zone Act of 2005. So this is an example of SEZ also. And this would be even ca uh, catering to customers which is outside its jurisdiction of domestic economy as well. So not just this would be helping in terms of India's growth, but even it will be having global contribution. It can be through finance. It can be through investments. It can be through financial products like insurance and then fundraising and asset management, wealth management, like when we're talking about the consultancy services in terms of financial planning. You want to plan, for example, retirement planning. Ke liye hota hai, so you'll have to start it from now. So there the role of cons uh, consultancy is important. Then what are prominent IFSCs globally? So globally we have, they're established in London, Dubai, New York, and Singapore. So... The Dubai F, uh, Financial Center is expanding five times faster. Then how has the gift city, it has fared so far in case of India? So the mandate is to accommodate the units like banking, capital market, fund management, insurance, bullion, finance, aircraft leasing. So everything which you can think about uh, the fintech is under it. Even the fintech or foreign universities, they are also present. So we are, we are, in a way, we are providing everything at one place when it comes to finance, be it education or the services or the consultancy and other options. And it has generated 16,000 employment opportunities. So IFSC planned in India includes setting up one at another Bandra Kurla complex in Mumbai also. And... So our average daily turnover on international exchanges at Gift City is more than $20 billion. This is the daily turnover, more than $20 billion. And similarly, in terms of capital market also, we have recently introduced, introduced the Fin Nifty Index. So that will be particularly tracking the progress of the fintech firms which are there. So we are seeing now reduced public float threshold in case of particularly IFSC firms. So the public float requirement for FS IFSCs have been reduced to 10%. Earlier it was 25%. And this would be promoting more of listing of the fintechs in the capital market platform. So that is one part how again we are relaxing the, the listing norms. And implementational challenges is that we are in the nascent stage. So we can learn from the experiences of the other countries and other IFA centers as we just talked. And it has only been four years that we have established the IFSC authority. And there are a lot of regulatory hiccups also right now. We are still into the experimentation stage. So we are trying and testing different things and new strategies and innovating. So considering again government's dedication, the government's will has also played an important role in terms of bridging the, the gaps which are there and even data security is very important because everything is happening digitally. Okay, next. So mm -hmm. 750 crore rupees worth agri shore fund to support the startups. So this would be... Uh, supporting agricultural startups and the rural enterprises. So when we are talking about the creation of more jobs in the non-farm sector, so this is one of the examples and also attracting youth. So there the role of agriculture ministry, NABARD and banks, insurance companies, private investors together would be achieving the, the objective here. So another like we have... Uh, 
450 crore rupees uh, it will function as a fund of funds then supporting the venture investors operating in agriculture so promoting more of joint ventures also and allied sectors then nabv ventures this is subsidiary of nabard so this is also looking into funding and so promoting more of again startup ecosystem startup culture particularly in agriculture and allied agriculture infrastructure also for example warehousing cold storages processing units so this will also help in again making the agriculture sector overall more productive because right now still we see that even more than 50 percent of our workforce still it is um, engaged or it depends upon the agricultural sector so disguised unemployment still remains a challenge which is again we can see increased because of more of reverse migration during the covid 19 time period so it has become a challenge and innovation and agri entrepreneurship development program is there which is under the Rashtri Krishi Vikas Yojana. So we are, again, we are linking the agricultural sector with more of development of scientific temper also. How we can integrate agriculture with the STEM sector. So that can help in further, even increasing the stability of income or even doubling the farmer's income and increasing their real wages. So more Indians taking multiple overseas trips. So Indian tourists. So here we are seeing major countries. So top five emerging countries is Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Bhutan, Hong Kong, Sri Lanka. Top five countries, the share of searches. If we analyze the trend, for example, make my trip website. So they have analyzed the changing trends in terms of the searches that people are doing for destination like UAE. We have seen again Dubai, Dubai tourism, Thailand, USA, Singapore and Indonesia. So even when we're talking about the importance of ASEAN, so there tourism, the scope of tourism is also, we are seeing people are more interested in visiting Bali or even Bangkok. And so number of geographies have rapidly gained popularity. This can be again because of even the impact of social media also. Like there's a trend going on. Ki more, ya to ab Dubai jao, ya fir you go to Bangkok or Bali. So it has increased by 37%. So again, the safety of the travelers is important. Then again, the role of the airlines is important in terms of how the pricing mechanism or air tickets prices is being determined specifically when we are seeing high demand during again if there is long weekends or the holiday season is coming up so that is another aspect and uh, even in terms of the visa facility uh, facility or the the destination countries so there their role is important in terms of allowing the travelers and ensuring the safety concerns. Okay, so that's all for the day. Thank you so much for joining us on Ansar Kari and stay tuned for further detailed videos in upcoming sessions.